It should be common knowledge by now that the Kuiper Belt, the ring of icy bodies that extends well beyond the orbit of Neptune, is home to some of the strangest objects in our solar system. Within this region are trillions of comets, asteroids, and large planetoids such as Pluto, Eris, and Makemake, a veritable planetary zoo in short. But one of its strangest oddities of all is probably that represented by what was once known as 2003 EL61, an object capable of summing up in itself some truly unique features. This distant outpost of the solar system travels in orbit with an average distance from the Sun of about 43 AU or 6.45 billion kilometers, going from a perihelion of 34.6 AU to an aphelion of 51.6 AU and taking a whopping 283 years to complete an entire revolution. A decidedly eccentric orbit, but one that nonetheless places EL61 in the category of so-called classical KBOs, Kuiper Belt objects, which differ from scattered objects, a category to which the more famous Eris belongs, i.e. those KBOs with highly elliptical and highly inclined orbits probably thrown into their present orbits through gravitational interactions with giant planets. In 2008, 2003 EL61 was officially designated as a dwarf planet, making it one of five such objects in our solar system after Pluto, Eris, Ceres, and Makemake. But as we are about to see in this video, the surprise is given to us by this extraordinary object, which we now know by its definitive name of Haumea, seemed destined to multiply. Singular fate that of 2003 EL61. Announced as a possible 10th planet in July of 2005, it soon after found itself at the center of such a spy story that it became famous even outside the astronomical sphere, only to end up in media oblivion just a month later because of the explosive conference in late August in which Michael Brown announced the discovery of 2003 UB313 the dwarf planet we now know as Eris. The payback came in the moments that followed, however, when astronomers realized they were dealing with a planet-sized object with a shape so unusual that it was truly unique among bodies beyond Pluto. But let's go in order. It all began on July 28, 2005, when José Luis Ortiz Moreno of the Institute of Astrophysics of Andalusia announced that he had discovered, by analyzing somewhat blatantly to tell the truth, some footage taken on March 7, 2003 with other colleagues at the Sierra Nevada Observatory in Spain, a new large object belonging to the generic class of Kuiper Belt objects. Just later, however, we learned from Mike Brown, California Institute of Technology, that the same object had already been detected on May 6, 2004 and that his team had not seen fit to announce it because they were still studying the possible presence of a satellite. So far, nothing unusual. Among the possible risks in delaying the announcement of a discovery is having it burned under one's nose. Brown and collaborators swallow the snub and congratulate the Spaniards. The trouble and controversy, however, begins a few days later, when the Americans realize that repeated accesses to the archives of their telescope observations of EL61 over the previous six months have occurred from the computers of the Andalusian Institute of Astrophysics. The suspicion of a sneak peek by the Spaniards is therefore very strong, and it immediately causes rivers of ink to run. Not only that, the possibility, albeit remote, that other discoveries in progress could also end up the same way induces Brown's team to hastily announce the news of the discovery of UB313, i.e. the large object that until the contrary decision of the International Astronomical Union in summer of 2006 will then be defined as the 10th planet of the solar system. Beyond any possible ethical judgments about what may or may not have happened, the fact that Ortiz and collaborators actually photographed EL61 first remains established, although the suspicion remains that it was only after the online acquisition of Brown's observations that the Spaniards went rummaging through the footage taken around the reported location. Which is why in the pages of the Minor Planet Center, the honor of the discovery is given to the Iberian team. Although perhaps to dilute the ill feeling, Mike Brown's staff has given priority over the choice of name, which will be Haumea, named after the Hawaiian goddess of fertility. Okay, controversy aside, 
At that point, astronomers had a conspicuous speck of light in their hands that appeared to be moving in the Kuiper belt along a fairly normal orbit. But how physically conspicuous the object was from the standpoint of mass and size was still unknown, nor were there any questions about its shape, which in the absence of evidence to the contrary was assumed to be roughly spherical. Yeah, how big could how may have been? Many times when astronomers discover objects like that, they don't really know how big they are, only how bright they are. Their brightness tells us how much sunlight they reflect, but they could be bright and reflect a lot of sunlight because they are big or they could be bright because they are highly reflective like a snowball. How then to go from brightness to size or at least mass? Well, in Haumea's case, luck gave astronomers a big hand because soon after the object was discovered, two small moons were also detected orbiting it. The first moon, later named Hiaka after the goddess Haumea's eldest daughter, was discovered on January 28, 2005 by observations at Keck Observatory, which for the occasion used an adaptive optic system with a laser guide star to correct for atmospheric turbulence in real time. From five observations made over six months, it was thus possible to accurately determine the orbit of the first satellite and later also its size. The result was that Hiaka has a diameter of about 310 kilometers and orbits Haumea on a circumference with a radius of 49,500 kilometers, which it travels in 49 days. The second moon discovered on June 30, 2005 and named Namaka after Haumea's youngest daughter is further inland and its diameter measures only 170 kilometers. Discovering the existence of a few small moons might seem irrelevant to further research, but in fact it is of decisive importance because once one knows the satellite's distance from the primary and its orbital period, it will be enough to apply Kepler's third law to arrive at determining the mass of the central body. Mass, which after an easy calculation turned out to be one-third that of Pluto. And this was confirmation that we were dealing with a decidedly large planetoid, the largest in terms of mass after Eris, Pluto, and Makemake. Unfortunately, mass can tell us something, but not everything about the real size of an object. A planet, an asteroid, a KBO, any celestial object can in fact be small and dense, like something made of rock, or large and not very dense like something made of ice. In order to trace the size, it then becomes necessary to make assumptions about the density, and then try to figure out what it is made of materially. Of course, the apparent brightness of an object can also be quite indicative of its size, but an object can be bright and reflect a lot of sunlight because it is large or even because its surface is highly reflective, like a snowball. This characteristic is called albedo, and basically its value returns the percentage of light reflected from an object's surface compared to the total incident light. In Haumea's case, no particular indication came from analysis of the surface color which was neutral like that of many other KBOs, a clue suggesting that its surface is presumably a mixture of ice and carbonaceous materials. Much surprise, however, was aroused some time after its discovery by the study of its light curve, which showed large fluctuations in brightness over a period of 3.9 hours, something that could only be explained by a rotation period of the same length which was surprising because at that point Haumea had become the fastest rotating KBO among those with a diameter of at least 100 kilometers. There was one problem, however. Such a rotation would change the hypothetical original spherical shape of any object, regardless of its density, to an elongated triaxial shape. And this, in Haumea's case, would have been a first for a KBO of that size. Confirmation was needed. Hey guys, just a moment before we continue. Be sure to join the Insane Curiosity channel. Click on the bell, you'll help us to make products of even higher quality. By that time, astronomers had managed to quantitatively define the value of parameters such as luminosity, mass, and period of rotation. Would it have been possible to combine them to express the actual size of Haumea? The answer is yes, even if only in a hypothetical and approximate way. And in this, computers would have come to the rescue with their ability to process thousands of models based on known features, and then compare the results with actual data from telescopic observations. Thus, it came to be defined that the most likely shape had to be that of a triaxial ellipsoid, 
with approximate dimensions of 2,000 by 1,500 by 1,000 kilometers, basically an American football made of rock and covered with a layer of ice. According to the modeling, in fact, Haumea could be as bright as snow, with a high albedo consistent with crystalline ice. But of course, there were many elements of uncertainty in this estimate, so much so that a layman would be prompted to ask, could it be that there is no way to directly observe the size of an object, even one so far away? Actually, there would be a way, that of the occultation of the star, which is that particular event that occurs whenever a solar system body observed from Earth passes in front of a star, casting its shadow on the ground. From the measurement of the time the star disappears, reappears, and the way the light dims, the sky-projected profile of the occulting body can be obtained and its possible atmosphere can be discovered, analyzed. Obviously, however, this is a method that cannot be used on command. Indeed, occultations of stars by objects with very small angular dimensions are very rare, and so one has to wait. In fact, the right opportunity came in 2017, many years after the discovery, when it became known that on January 21st of that year, Haumea would ellipse a star of 17th magnitude, 25,000 times fainter than the faintest star visible to the naked eye, with a band of totality that would pass over Central Europe. Dozens of observers, both professional and amateur, followed the event in that region in order to measure the duration of the eclipse, or even to report the absence of the eclipse from their location. This information eventually made it possible to reconstruct the complete 3D shape of Haumea, which turns out to have a major axis of at least 2,322 kilometers, larger than previously thought and quite comparable to the diameter of Pluto or Eris, the most massive dwarf planet in the solar system which are 2,375 and 2,325 kilometers, respectively. Knowing mass and size, the average density was then also finally obtained, which turned out to be 1.8 grams per cubic centimeter, a considerably lower value than the 2.6 grams per cubic centimeter that Haumea was thought to have, based on the assumption that its elongated shape was determined by a condition of hydrostatic equilibrium. By now, the picture was emerging, but there was still an oddity coming, perhaps the most surprising one of all. Indeed, during the occultation, before and after the central event, unexpected secondary dimming was observed in the star's light, a case quite similar to the one that led to the discovery in 1977 of Uranus's very faint rings, which occurred precisely during the planet's occultation of a star. And that was perhaps why the strange dips in brightness, short-lived and tonally unexpected, were immediately attributed to the presence of a ring, a ring that eventually turned out to be 4,560 kilometers in diameter and 70 wide, a structure probably composed of icy debris, coplanar with both Haumea's equator and the orbit of its satellite Hiaka, something completely unexpected, all the more so for such a uniquely shaped object. The radius of the ring places it close to the 3 to 1 mean motion resonance with Haumea's rotation period. That is, Haumea rotates three times on its axis in the time that a particle in the ring completes one revolution. We must therefore regard Haumea as a kind of small Saturn, the only trans-Neptunian object to have this characteristic. The first asteroid to be shown to have a ring system was Chariklo, an object 230 kilometers in diameter. Again, the discovery was made following the observation of a stellar occultation on June 3, 2013. Another minor body around which a ring is suspected is Chiron, 166 kilometers in diameter. However, these two asteroids are small in size and belong to the Centaur class. That is, they are asteroids moving between the orbits of Uranus and Saturn, transitioning between the outer and inner solar systems. The discovery of a ring around Haumea, a body very distant from the Sun in a completely different dynamical class, much larger than Chariklo and Chiron, possessing a pair of satellites and with a strange triaxial shape on the other hand, raises many questions. For example, is it possible that rings are common structures around large objects in the Kuiper Belt? And if the answer is positive, how did they form? Perhaps in the Kuiper Belt, collisional evolution was much more violent than previously thought. Do the rings have anything to do with Haumea's strange shape? And why does Haumea not have a rarefied atmosphere like Pluto? 
The first question has begun to be answered positively by the 2023 discovery of two evanescent rings also around the large KBO Quawar. The other astronomers are trying to answer by hypothesizing that 4.5 billion years ago, when the solar system was being formed, the object that is now Haumea must have been a ball made half of ice and half of rock and about the size of Pluto, very similar to what we think Pluto is today. Early in its history, another large object in the Kuiper Belt collided obliquely with Haumea. This collision melted most of the surface ice, and the impact ended up disproportionately increasing Haumea's rotational velocity. The resulting centrifugal force then stretched it into the football shape we see today. Some of the impact debris then coalesced into satellites, while the finer debris would go on to form the ring. This scenario has also been confirmed by the discovery of some KBOs that are traveling in orbits quite similar to Haumea's. And what is even more interesting is that the collision occurred in a region of space where Kuiper Belt objects do not live long without their orbits becoming unstable due to gravitational resonance with Neptune. When orbits become unstable, objects can eventually make their way to the inner solar system, where we would call them comets. Clearly, the giant impact that created the Haumea family must have created many, many small fragments that have lit up Earth's skies in the past. More interestingly, Haumea is on an unstable orbit and will probably become a comet. When it does, it will probably be 10,000 times brighter than the spectacular comet Hale-Bopp, making it something like the brightness of the full moon and easily visible in the daytime sky. The only downside is that all this will happen in perhaps 1 billion years, so you'll have to wait a while to see it. All in all, albeit in a certainly fragmentary picture, the forgotten EL61 is turning out to be one of those objects that at some point in the scientific journey aimed at building a possible scenario for a drastic reversion of preconceived ideas. Never before its discovery, in fact, could it have been assumed that such a large planetoid could present itself with a shape so far from the hydrostatic equilibrium shape, also called for in the International Astronomical Union Resolution, that establishes the characteristics an object must have to be called a planet or a dwarf planet. Okay, we've come to the end, and if you've followed us this far, you'll no doubt agree that Haumea is a real space platypus, i.e. a composite and impossible beast. And I already know what you're thinking. Of course, it would be nice to go all the way there and verify it for yourself, or through the eyes of a probe, as New Horizons did with Pluto. Unfortunately, so far no mission to Haumea has been planned. However, numerous scenarios have been calculated using hypothetical launch dates. For example, if a probe were launched on September 25, 2025, a flyover of Haumea could materialize as early as December 2039, with the dwarf planet at 48.18 AU from the Sun. Unfortunately, we are already late for such a mission, and this is really a pity. It would have been incredible and exciting to be able to see up close in our lifetime such a totally alien and contradictory object, wouldn't it?